Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Everyone send a lollipop to President Obama because he's sure going to need one. He's going to need more than he has because he just suffered the greatest defeat in his entire political career. That's right. And those trying to bail the president out from this great defeat are the Republican Party. The Republicans are trying to bail out President Obama from a trade deal that would, let us say, gut American industry and American jobs to an extent that we'd never recover from. And what's interesting here is that Senate Democrats announced today that they're going to vote to block a debate on fast-track legislation. Now, much of this is gobbledygook to the average American. You don't know what's really going on. But Obama's trying to sell out the last remnants of American industry, American workers. It's so bad. The guy is such a traitor that his own party turned on him. Every free trade deal that the U.S. has signed has brought about an increased trade deficit and hundreds of thousands of lost American jobs. Every single free trade deal, NAFTA, GAFTA, GATT, WTO, and now this one. It's beyond belief that as a conservative American, I want to thank all the Democrats, including the most liberal of them, who got together to block this dangerous bill. This TPP Asia trade bill is a nightmare. How many jobs would be gutted? Nobody really knows. But if Obama's for it, it must be bad for America. That's all I know. If Obama is for it and his own party's left wing is against it, you can just imagine how far he's gone uh, to the left. And what's funny about this is that as a nationalist, uh, I cannot believe that it took Democrats, liberal Democrats, to defeat even a debate on the bill. Now, what is the bill about? I'm only going to give it a, a short version. The bill would give President Obama the authority to bring forward a trade bill in the future upon which Congress could either vote yes or no, but they could not amend it. In other words, it would give him total power over uh, future trade. And for whatever the reasons are, it's the left wing in the Democrat Party that said no to even debating it. Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat, no. Opposition. Uh, Maria Cantwell, as left as they come, no. Dianne Feinstein, no. Claire McCaskill, left-wing fanatic, no. Patty Murray, never saw a communist manifesto she didn't want to frame in the White House, no. Bill Nelson, Democrat, fanatic leftist, no. Mark Warner, no. The Senate needs 60 votes to begin a debate on fast-track authority. They said no. The procedural vote, by the way, is scheduled, well, I think it was, I think it's killed. It isn't happening. It was scheduled for 2.30 p.m. today. And with the defections, it appears the vote will go down uh, to a no. Now, the spokesmouth for Obama, Josh Ernst, the mini Goebbels of our time, said that it was only a procedural snafu. Uh, that uh, blocked the vote. But the rest of it will be boring to you. I get it. I just wanted to give you the news, by the way. So here are some of the questions. As you know, today is launch date for my uh, brilliant novel, Countdown to Mecca. And so you would expect me to ask you, did you see Countdown to Mecca in the bookstores? Did you go look for it? Where was it? Was it under feminine hygiene? Did they place Countdown to Mecca under the feminine hygiene section, perhaps? Will you buy one and you get a get one free? Let's put it that way. Have you bought Countdown to Mecca in a bookstore? I think it's an important story because since I'm the most boycotted major media figure, if I'm not for myself, who will be? I have few friends in the media. One of them is Laura Ingram, the queen of talk radio. She had me on today. I'd like you to hear some of that later on. I was also on a local show uh, with Brian Sussman and and I was uh, the local KSFO, great, great interview on Countdown to Mecca. But listen what it's about. WND said, new savage novel, plot to blow up Mecca, but it's not what some might think. What's this? 
they ask. Michael Savage's newly released novel is about blowing up Mecca. They say yes. Countdown to Mecca, the final episode of a trilogy that began with abuse of power and a time for war, is about a plot to destroy Islam's holy city. But it's not what many, particularly Savage's liberal critics, are inclined to think. You see, Savage's hero, Jack Hatfield, is the one man who might be able to stop the attack on Mecca. So I want to appeal to the Muslims in the audience who are not fanatical to understand what I'm trying to do here. In the novel, Hatfield is a freelance TV producer who lost his top-rated opinion show because of a liberal media smear campaign by a group that resembles Media Matters. Savage told WND in an interview, I don't call for blowing up Mecca. This is the thing. This is what the liberals are going to do. The same libs who got me banned from England are going to say my novel count on the Mecca is too controversial and should be burned. Savage explained the book is about a renegade group of generals who plot to destroy Mecca, but it also deals in plain terms with the people responsible for the conflict in the first place. It shows what could happen given the militancy of radical Islam and the passivity of Barack Obama, he said. There could be a renegade group of generals who plan some catastrophic event to stop this madness that has been going on for millennia against the West. And we all know that would lead to Armageddon, which none of us would benefit from, he said. Anyway, you get the picture, right? This is the Savage Nation. The phone number is 855-400-7282. And without further ado, I've decided to do something for you that I've never done before, because I think would be of interest to you as radio listeners. And that is, I'm going to read the first two pages of the first five chapters. Prologue, St. Petersburg, Russia, Aeroport, Pukovo. You'll notice all the settings, those of you who know anything, are carefully researched. Everything in my books are carefully, all of these things are carefully researched. Pyotr Ansky's pale eyes were dead as he walked through Terminal 2 toward his flight. He saw everyone without empathy or interest. It had been that way since his first assignment years before. Passing through the last of three security checkpoints, Ansky glanced uncaring at two middle-aged transportation officers, his face like that of any distracted, put-upon, 30-something traveler. That was his disguise this day. Pulling on his shoes at the end of the security line, Piotr imagined himself to be what his visa said he was, a computer contractor headed for a programming job in Jordan. Piotr made his way through security without incident. Russia Airlines was just proud of its aviation security program which found no weapons or contraband on him or in his backpack during his third and final search prior to boarding. He smiled as he found his seat at the rear of the cabin. Piotr allowed himself a sliver of satisfaction as he appeared to stretch before sitting. He was not just an assassin. There were plenty of those on the international market. He was one of a unique breed, a professional comedian doing a consummate infiltration. There was no time to savor his successful boarding. Piotr went to the lavatory where he reviewed the next scene of operations. The 737-500 had a cruising speed, 800 clicks an hour. Maximum flight altitude was 12,300 meters. Seating capacity was 117. He mentally reviewed the layout, the exits, the cockpit configuration. He emerged and looked around. The flight was not full, but Piotr noted every face on board. Intense young businessmen, older businessmen, drunk from the airport bar, a family with an eight-year-old, women in burkas, accompanied by their husbands and brothers. Piotr did that for every single face of the 94 people on board before deciding who the Russian security agent was. Piotr had no doubt there would be a plain clothes undercover operative. This was, after all, a flight to Amman, Jordan. Islamic terrorism had long been considered a major threat to the security of Russia, both before and after the Soviet era. Four things would mark him. He would have a sport coat to cover his weapon. He would possess a penetrating stare as he analyzed passengers for potential threats. He'd be middle-aged, retired from the military, but with enough bulk to suggest he'd once been athletic. And he would be a man. There was only one woman in the force, and Piotr already knew she was assigned to flights originating to Moscow and New York. Ahead aisle seat, row 16, I'll seat economy class. Near the exit door, he saw the shadow of a shoulder holster as the agent leaned forward. The man sat alone. That would make things easier. Satisfied, Piotr Ansky fell into a seat, but did not relax after takeoff. 
As the aircraft started over the Black Sea 1,000 miles from Kovo, the co-pilot emerged to use the bathroom. Piotr knew that was coming. The man had used the lavatory when he boarded to put a full bottle of Putinka vodka in the trash. Many Russian pilots, also former military aviators, had a drinking problem. The agents who had taken this flight during the past fortnight, I'll stop right there. Those are the first two pages of Countdown to Mecca. If you're not gripped, you will be when I turn to the first two pages of Chapter 1 when I return right here on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Welcome back to the uh, Savage Nation, and uh, I hope I'm entertaining you. I'm going to read uh, another two pages from Chapter One of a, uh, <laughs> of Countdown to Mecca, just out today. And I've asked you if you've gone to the bookstores to see if you can find the bookers that buried under uh, feminine hygiene in the back or under vitamins, because I know that there's a sabotage campaign. I don't have to. I don't have to even tell you that. I can tell you from within and outside. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting here like complaining about it. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever will be, will be. If it sells 5,000 copies or 50,000 copies, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. The message is what matters. But since you are radio listeners, I have an obligation to you first as a radio listener to inform you and, and entertain you. And so I'm going to do that in the next few minutes by continuing to read Two pages only from each of five chapters today to see what you think of uh, of the book. And I'm going to ask you if you've gone into the bookstores and what you've encountered. Rick on WABC in New York. Rick, which bookstore did you go in and what happened? It's in the Hamptons. It's a small town. I don't want to give away which area. I went in looking for the book. Oh, we don't carry all the books, blah, blah, blah. And we might carry it. We might not. And then I go... Then the guy goes, well, for books like that, we have to order 12 or, you know, whatever their minimum is. So I, got, I asked him, what would that be? He goes, oh, 400 and change. I put $500 on the counter. Now, I'm a construction worker, so I didn't look like the guy. Well, you, put down, you put down money to buy 12 copies just to make sure they, they carried it? Oh, yeah, because he said that's the only way they would order it. I go, that's, I'm that's, you know, he's lying to you because the book industry is very antiquated. And they have a full 100% return policy. Any books that don't sell can be returned, uh, and, and the bookstore is not billed. He's lying to you. Yeah, well, then it came, well, I don't know if oh. I could do that. I have to call my boss, and they're not in until Friday. So basically, they don't want to sell the book. The bottom line is, you know. Yeah, well, I'm sending you a free copy. You don't have to put up money for me. I mean, that's very kind of you. I have the most loyal audience in the radio business, incidentally. And I mean, I never heard a story like this in my life where a guy will put up 500 bucks to have a bookstore buy the book at a minimum of 12. But shame on that book clerk. He should he should go move to China where books are banned, I suppose. I want to thank you. Stay on the line. WABC, Izzy. Izzy, you're on the Savage Nation. Izzy, what's on your mind? I'm hearing any of your books. I never read any long-time listener, but fantastic read. I was wondering if they sell them in the New York City area, too, where I live. What do you mean? You have to go to the bookstores to buy to find like a Barnes and Noble or one of those stores, you know. Well, they sell all of them. I don't know. They might check it out, see what happens. I have three minutes left in this segment, and again, to entertain my radio audience, I'm going to go to chapter one now. The preface contained, or described rather, the assassin Piotr Ansky boarding a plane in Russia. You know what's coming there. At least you think so. But the action is beyond belief. It's researched as well as anybody could research assassinations. And I interviewed people who know the inside story of these things. Chapter 1, page 9, Countdown to Mecca, San Francisco, California. Sammy Michaels was dozing on his, on his comfortable threadbare sofa when he heard a key move in the door of his second floor Montgomery Street at studio apartment. As his eyes opened, so did the door. A blonde, barefoot, platinum-eyed vision in a low-cut, form-fitting black micro-mini dress jumped in panting. His neighbor, Anastasia Vincent, and his half-brother, Jack, were the only ones who had a key, and this definitely wasn't Jack Hatfield. 
Jack hadn't been here in over a year, which was the last time they spoke. It was to thank him for a jazz CD Sammy had sent as a birthday present and peace offering. Sam, she gulped in her charming accent. They are after me. Who is, Sammy asked. Very bad men, she said, shaking. Her eyes normally alert as those as a Nordic wolf seemed wary and frightened. Sammy's marine training was a little rusty. He hadn't worn a uniform for years, not since he was on one of his motorcycles when a teen driver had hit him, sending him into a year of physical therapy and paving the way for a handsome settlement with the insurance company. Still, as the saying goes, once a Marine, always a Marine, Sammy was up and moving past her in an instant. He slammed his apartment door shut behind her, rattling the painting he'd bought at a flea market showing a shipwreck in the Farallon Islands. Then he looked, then he locked and bolted the door and turned toward her. It's okay, he said, you're safe now. Her arctic eyes locked on his, are you sure? He wasn't, but he said, absolutely. No one would ever expect to find a beautiful girl in my apartment. She smiled half-heartedly. You are making a joke. I wish. Now relax and tell me what's going on, Sammy coaxed. She began to calm. He maneuvered her to the sofa and sat next to her, looking intently into her eyes. It was easy. They were the brightest, lightest blue he had ever seen. But he kept one ear trained on the door on the steps outside. They were old wooden steps, and they creaked. It would be difficult for anyone to sneak up on him. Anastasia Vincent was a strong, very special girl. Within weeks of her moving here from Moscow, he had learned she was a high-class call girl. That was probably how she got into this country, paying her way with favors, but that didn't matter. If there was one thing he learned in his 37 years, people did what they had to do. Hell, he was a professional party clown. Not a party animal, but a bona fide clown. Big red wig, big red nose, big red slippers, and lots of polka dots in between. Who was he to judge others? I'll pause right there. That's page 10 of Countdown to Mecca. Again today, two pages from the first five chapters. I'll be right back. Have you looked for it in a bookstore? What'd you find? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Breaking news today in the Savage Nation. As predicted, liberal Democrats gave Barack Obama a black eye. It's the biggest black eye of his life. Now, I got to explain to you, this trade deal was shot down not by the Republicans, but by the liberal Democrat wing. What you should also know is that this was Obama's biggest priority since forcing socialized medicine down our throats which they did through trickery, telling us we'll learn what's in the bill after, we, after they pass it. They did the same thing here. This was shown to congressmen and congresswomen only in secret, only in the basement. They were not allowed to take notes out. It's like something out of a bad novel, what this character in the White House has done to this country. He has brought the worst elements of the Stasi to the intelligence community, the worst elements of gangsters in the ex-Soviet Union to the White House itself, but he's such a smooth con man that many of you still think he's a wonderful, kind, loving man. His own party said no to him today. So put that into your pipe and smoke it with your medical marijuana. And what can I say about Republicans who tried to get this passed? What can I say about sellouts like McConnell and about Orrin Hatch that I haven't said before? Nothing. And that's why I tell you the news is frustrating, and it's why I want to go back to my new novel launched today, Countdown to Mecca. And when I ask you uh, whether you were able to buy it, you're going to hear stories that will show you once again the censorship that goes on in this country against Michael Savage and against conservatives in general. KBOI Radio, Ed, what did you experience today in your attempts to buy the novel? Yes, I um, go to the Barnes and Noble here in Washington and Idaho. I run an armor car route, and I called every one of them to see if I could buy it because I love your other books. And I look forward to reading it, and they're not carrying it. They don't have it, but you, they'll order it for you, but they were really reluctant to even talk about it. That's right, because it's not about Rebecca has two mommies or about the wonders of Fidel Castro uh, or how great gay marriage is. Therefore, they can't carry a book. This is how far we've come. It's the equivalent of book burning. 
We have the equivalent of book burning by uh, not buying certain books for chain stores. That's book burning. And I'm sending you a free copy, though, so I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Let me take one more call on this subject, because uh, this is shocking to me, by the way. When you see the big chains, I know they ordered the book. They printed, I think, 55,000 copies. Incidentally, let me be clear. I think the number is 55,000 first printing, which is enormous. You know, when you, you know, can I tell you something about the scale of publishing today? Something you don't know, and it's very difficult for authors today. When I was growing up, if I looked at heroes of mine like Ernest Hemingway, you look at the numbers of books that they sold. Uh, you look at authors like, on, on a different scale, Henry Miller. You look at the numbers of books they sold. And then you get into the commercial marketplace, as I am, and you see a first printing of 55,000. You realize, ah, it's not a big deal. It's not a million copy bestseller. You know what the pressures are on authors today to make numbers? It's beyond comprehension. And it's a miracle that I can get published at all, incidentally. I mean, I could always go back to self-publishing, as I did uh, with Band in Britain and some radio stories. I have my own publishing company. I can always put things out that way, but I'm talking about the mass market, what a censorship campaign is and what it does to the sales of a book. And that's why it's an important note, a side note, by the way. 855-400-7282. WABC in New York. Ferris, go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. Good afternoon, Doc. I wanted to let you know what we're finding in the capital region of Connecticut. There's a suburb of Hartford. This is my show to say something else. I know your voice. You change your name every day. What are you trying to say? My name is, my name is Ferris Flock. It's, it's spelled F-L-U-K-E. I don't care what your name is. What is it you're trying to say? Why are you mentioning Laura over and over again? Why? Well, because she spoke up for you when I met her at the bookstore. Good. And, and what's the point of today's call? Well, the, the, here's the point. that The bookstore in her town have countdown to mecca but the bookstores in the capital city of hartford you know we have a particular disdain for the the city of hartford because it is decrepit it's in the hands of corrupt uh, officials and that bookstore denies uh the book even though they say that uh, today is all right I, it's a fair call i'm going to send you a free copy countdown to mecca is on the way well let me continue with my little exercise in in uh freedom of the press and I'm going to go now to chapter three, again, the first pages of the next chapter. I'm moving on in the book. Remember, I'm only going to read two pages of five chapters, and then it's done today. That's it. It's going to be painless, and I think it's entertaining, or I wouldn't do it. Remember, the radio audience comes first, not the book-buying audience. I've got my priorities straight. So, chapter three. Jack had walked to the Hyatt. He intended to get a cab. You're coming with me, Saul, told Jack. The men started toward the street. I don't know what this is about, Jack said. I'm not sure I need heavy artillery, not your kind. But you're not sure you don't, Saul said. Don't worry, this is on the house, the right anyway. Now remember, Saul is the Jewish gangster. There was no time to argue. Saul's car was parked right out front with a goon. The mobster whispered something to the bodyguard, and then dismissed them with a jerk of his thumb and got behind the wheel. Jack climbed into the passenger side of the mobster's factory-armored S-600. Want me to punch directions into the GPS, Jack uh, asked. GPS, he scoffed. This is my town too, Jack. Just tell me where we're going. Jack did, and Saul peeled from the front of the hotel. He shot into traffic like a shark going after a meal. What are you getting into, Saul asked, as they zipped through the late afternoon traffic in San Francisco. Jack filled him in on what he knew. Sound, on what he knew. Sounds interesting, Saul said neutrally. Yeah, Jack agreed as he used his cell phone to look up the general Sammy had named. Or it could all be nothing. My brother isn't the best judge of character. This girl could be on drugs or just crazy or lying. Though that would be a hell of a strange lie to make up, Jack thought. I've heard people spill their guts when they're on drugs, Saul said. Their narratives lack cohesion. Everyone lacks cohesion these days, including CEOs, Jack shot back. You know why, Saul asked, nodding toward the windshield. See there? You got a trolley driver, a postal carrier, a police officer. You know what they all have in common? Uniforms? Unions. Meaning, there's a buffer between them and personal responsibility, Saul said. You know why I do what I do? Power, not me. It's the risk 
I like, said the gangster. Every day's a gamble. When I succeed, I make money. Those around me make money. But if I screw up, I'm a dead man. Those guys in the union screw up, they've got strength in numbers. Even when someone makes a mistake and people die because of that mistake, like an air traffic controller who takes a personal call when he should be watching planes, he's got an organization that insulates him, pads the fall. I got none of that. I'm rewarded for what I do or I have to answer for it. You too. You've got personal responsibility. He wove around the car that was going too slowly. What we're doing now is about personal responsibility, about duty to family, about doing what's right. That used to be the American way, said Saul. It was done during World War II when the government worked with the Italian gangsters to find who was sabotaging ships docked on the East River. And let me tell you something else, Jack. In 20 years, you're going to see the recruitment of white Aryan nation types by whites in gated communities to protect themselves from the armies of Obama's spawn. No argument there, Jack said with an angry shake of his head. He and Clinton let the Muslim interests overrun this country. Not the religious, not the faithful, but the hateful. They failed to filter out the ones who have nothing but hate and murder behind their obsequious smiles and disingenuous eyes. Saul snorted. Who's got the big vocabulary now? I'll stop right there. What you understand in what I'm reading to you right now is that I write political thrillers. And I have my characters express opinions that are not permitted to be expressed on Fox News. 855 there is big news out there. There's another topic I'm going to get to today, which I think is interesting. Poll shows those in the U.S. drifting away from religion, which is an interesting story. The number of adults who self-identified as Christian fell from 78% to 70% driven mainly by drops among Roman Catholics and some Protestants, according to the Stinking Pew Research Center poll. Non-religious U.S. adults who identify as atheist, agnostic, or of no particular faith have seen their ranks swell over that same time period by 6 percent points to 22.8 or 56 million people. In other words, religion is dying in America somewhat. So I'm going to ask those of you under 30, because if I say, I, you know, have you left the church, most of my audience are older people. You'll say, no, I haven't. I go every Sunday. Please don't call if you're over 30. I want to know why the so-called millennials have given up on religion. That's an interesting question. And if you're under 30 and you're no longer religious, please tell. And I don't care what your religion is, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, because I guarantee you as I speak to you on this show today that even young Muslims are not faithful anymore. So you don't understand what's going on. This may not be as bad as it seems. 855-400-7282 is the phone number. Let me take a couple of quick calls. W, where's W Jim? Where is Jim? Uh, okay, Pat on K. Okay, I'm sorry. Pat on KSFO Radio. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind? Hi, Michael. I've listened to you for 20 years, and today I went into Barnes & Noble to buy your book, and, of course, there was absolutely nothing in the store. Um, I went up to customer service, and I was informed that they have ordered 17 copies from the publisher, and they might be in today, but there's no guarantee. Isn't that horrible? It just shows you what's... See, I told the publisher that unless the books are in the store today, the pub date, and if my listeners go in and it's not there, they're losing that buyer. And you know what? I know there's subterfuge going on under the surface. It's not coming from any particular person. They see my name. It's a blacklist, and it runs from Fox News right through the radio industry. And again, I'm not playing the victim. What, what will be will be. At the end of the day, I'm having a good life. But the fact of the matter is, it's a disappointment to people like you. And so let me, uh, Pat, send you a free copy of Countdown to Mecca. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-M. This, this is really the biggest political story of Obama's career. He got defeated today by his own liberal wing. They knocked down Obama trade. And the only people out there trying to salvage it 
are the sellout Benedict Arnolds in the Republican Party. Listen, I got to tell you something. I know how complicated politics are for the average person, and they're very complicated. Sometimes I try to put my mind into the average listener, and I watch a lot of pulp shows on television at night. First of all, I like them. They relax me. There's one I like on investigation discovery, like Crazy Neighbors, Neighbors from Hell, that usually go bad, or, you know, Wives with Knives. I love those shows. And one of the reasons I like it is they're well acted. They're good melodramas. They've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you more or less know it ends in tragedy. So it's like, it's worth waiting during the ads, you know, and this and that. But then they flash in the middle of the actors, the real people that they're portraying, if you've ever watched it. And I like to actually see the real persons, the real people who committed these crimes. They look like the average person next door. And they'll show them in their houses in Columbus and Ohio, sitting in their busted out, you know, easy chair with the wife before she dies of cancer. And then he goes berserk and shoots his neighbor because the snowblower was too loud. Shoots him seven times on the ground like, what? Are you kidding me? And then his scum lawyer gets him off saying it was uh, self-defense. The snowblower threatened him. He thought he was going to be attacked by the snowblower. <laughs> I swear to God, how do lawyers live with themselves? I mean, why don't they just get up in the morning and cut their throats, guys like that? I mean, I recognize you're supposed to be as vociferous in your defense of a client as possible, but must you lie about it? I say to myself, but anyway, the point is, I look at a guy like that in a show like that, and I say to myself, if he's listening to my show, he's not going to pick up on the esoterica that I do. He's not going to go for the highbrow stuff that I do from time to time. He wants the meat and potatoes. He wants Democrats bad. Republicans, good white Americans. He wants to hear the pap that Rush Limbaugh feeds every day. Dems bad, repubs good. Dems bad, repubs good. Dems bad, repubs good. Well, now the new twist from those who are Republican water carriers is that the Republicans are also bad. They all copied my act, the independent Michael Savage. So the point is, it's very complicated. So what are you listening to the radio for? You're going to get the news. You get the news anyway. You get it every, every 10 minutes on a news show. My job is to kind of give you an analysis of the news. So here's an analysis of the big news of the day. Your president, I call him the amazing shrinking president. Not only is he physically disappearing, he f actually I'm frightened for him. I think he's sick. Am I the only one who says the king is sick? Why is he so skinny? If you had a family member who was shrinking away physically like this, would you not worry about him? I mean, he is the president. I despise his politics, but he is the president of my nation. So the guy not only is shrinking, the amazing shrinking president, not only shrinking physically, which is worrisome, but he's shrinking politically. His signature bill was Obamacare socialized medicine, which he snuck in and coerced in. He tried the same with Obama trade, and his own party screwed him. And the only people trying to save him are the so-called good Republicans uh, that uh, Rush Limbaugh loves so well. It's unbelievable to me what's going on. It's getting more complicated by the day to figure this out. So the real question is, why do liberal Democrats oppose the Obama trade bill? Why would these phenomenal left-wing fanatics like Ron Wyden, Dianne Feinstein, why? Why? Why would they not want this trade bill with China? Why are the unions opposed to it? Because the unions, as you well know, are out to destroy America just as well as the Democrat Republican Party is. So why all of a sudden is the union concerned about jobs in America when they haven't been concerned all along? If the unions were concerned about jobs in America, would they be for bringing in millions and millions of workers who are undercutting uh, salaries, for example, on H-1B visas? Don't tell me the unions care about jobs. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is they're bringing in as many skilled workers as they can to make sure that that greedy pig Mark Zuckerberg makes billions more I loved him marching in an undershirt for illegal aliens like he cares about illegal aliens Mark Faceberg he wants cheap IT workers don't you get it it's the Savage Nation join the Savage Nation call now 855-400-SAVAGE 855-400-7282 Savage Warning. 
The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Well, it happened. The amazing shrinking president is not only physically disappearing, but he has politically disappeared as well. His left wing has basically defeated him on the trade bill. It actually wasn't the trade bill per se. It was a debate about whether to go to the trade bill on a vote. And the left wing said no to him on this secret, sneaky, anti-jobs bill. And the only people trying to save it are Mitch McConnell uh, and Orrin Hatch, the same people, by the way, who gave us the uh, likes of Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the United States Supreme Court. Same people who gave us Loretta Lynch are now trying to give us a trade bill with China that would kill jobs and industries. So there it is. Now the White House is putting the spin on it, saying that this defeat was only a procedural snafu, etc. But the fact is, this was the biggest loss in Obama's political career. My only wish would be that uh, the same coalition would get together to put a stop to the flood of illegal aliens coming into America and take a close look at the type of immigrants that Obama has prioritized into the United States of America to remake it in his own image that is largely not white. You know, one of these days I'm going to do a show on the European-American contributions to civilization, particularly our society and our civilization. I am so sick of listening to this rubbish about the white male and the white race and white privilege that I'm going to do a whole show an entire show, I've done it before, by the way, on white male inventions, which was immediately ignored by the media. But the fact of the matter is, I'm sick of listening to this garbage. And if I'm going to hear shows about African American, Asian American, Indian American, this American, well, what's wrong with doing a show on European Americans and their contributions to civilization, especially ours? But I want to turn to this European American's contributions to civilization, Michael Savage, since I come from people who came from Europe, and I'm an American, I'm a European American, and uh, I've contributed a number of books, broadcasts, I've rescued some rainforests, I've done some scientific research that will last for centuries, by the way. The collections are in museums around the world. I never talk about it, but you'll find that it's true. And today I want to talk about a novel called Countdown to Mecca, which is launched today in the bookstores after long last. I've been waiting for it to come out for months now with all the news about Islam and this and that. I thought it should have been out a month ago. So what I've done is something I've never done before. And I have one, two more chapters to go. I said that I would read the first two pages of each of the first five chapters today. And then maybe the next time I'm on the radio, I'll read the next two pages of the first five chapters for a couple of days to see what you think of it. And then I'm asking you if you could find the book in the bookstores. We're getting one report after another of the bookstores not having the book. Once again, Michael Savage is banned uh, from bookstores. Once again, there's a blacklist. Once again, there's subterfuge. Once again, there's sabotage. And then we're talking about a political topic which is a poll showing those in the United States drifting away from religion. Now, since this was done by the Pew group, I don't really trust it that much. But it says the number of people identifying as Christians went down from 78% to 70% from 07 to 014. Okay. Uh, those who identified as Jewish rose 0.2%. Now, how can you figure that out? While those identifying as Muslim more than doubled to 0.9%, no kidding. Those identified as Hindus rose slightly to 0.7%. Thank God for that. I love Indian food. Uh, the more curry joints, the better. And of course, that's not what the Indians are bringing anymore. They're, they're, they're tech workers, so guys like Zuckerberg can make more billions. And Microsoft, Mr. Nice Guy, can pocket even more money. And the number of Buddhists was unchanged at 0.7%. The poll surveyed roughly 35,000 adults across the U.S. between June and September by telephone. Tell, yeah, by telephone. 
excuse me, by telephone? Hello? Who is it? I'm with the pupil, drop dead, and you hang up. What do you mean by telephone? They don't even use cell phones? They call landlines on a pole and they think this is an accurate survey? All right, hold it a minute. Beyond belief. So that's the topic we're going to talk about. Now, I turn on the cable channels. They're all like genuflecting now. Another black youth uh, was apparently shot by a cop in Madison, Wisconsin. So the entire world has come to an end. Uh, they're already rioting. They haven't burnt Madison yet to the ground. But soon, this is going on now for an hour on four, four channels. This is the only thing we're supposed to pay attention to now is uh, this kind of incident. So I'm going to go back to what matters to me, which is ideas and entertainment. So let's go to the next chapter of Countdown to Mecca. Those of you who've been listening got a treat, because many of you, most of you won't, won't buy a book. In the last uh, chapter three, page two, two pages, Jack is walking with Saul Minsky, the Jewish gangster, and they're talking about, you know, things that are very political. And which, remember, we closed about unions and stuff like that. So now we go to chapter four, West Point, New York, where the generals who are plotting to do this horrible thing are first introduced. Well, it's after the, the hooker scene in the Hyatt. Okay, page 34, West Point, New York. Stop navel-gazing, Captain. General Montgomery Morton snapped as he and Captain Stephen Reynolds marched across the empty field of West Point Skeet Range. It was quiet on campus. The students and faculty were on vacation. But as high-ranking alumni and military officers, they still had the run of the place. The sooner we get this over with, the better. In normal times, Captain Reynolds, the man Anastasia Vincent had dubbed Palor, wouldn't be anywhere near his alma mater. But these were not normal times. What he and the others were trying to do had been described as ambitious by some members of the team, crazy by others. Whether it succeeded depended on how well they all completed their assignments. Reynolds had taken great personal pride in his end of the mission, securing the orthorhombic element they needed, getting it on a passenger aircraft rather than a military transport, smuggling it out of Russia, ditching the aircraft on the Caspian Sea, and conveying it by motorized raft to the Azerbaijani shore. The plan was flawless. He had, some, had something gone wrong with the execution? Well, at least it's a beautiful day for a hanging Colonel Andrew Bullseye Taylor, the man Anastasia thought of as kid, smirked. As usual, his attitude grated on Morton's nerves. He was the spoiled scion, scion of a wealthy family, sliding through life with a smug grin on his face. Shut up, Bullseye, Morton snapped. You know your wisecracks don't fly with the general. Well, the way he sounded, I'd be surprised if anything would be flying with the general anymore, Taylor said to Morton. Don't you know when you're, you've been summoned to an execution? Silence settled on the three men, unremarkable in their tweed shooting clothes. They made their way onto the United States Military Academy's outdoor rifle range, arriving at the ordered time. General Thomas Brook, Brooks, also in a tweed jacket, was standing at the outdoor rifle table lined with Browning, Cesar Gorini, and Winchester shotguns. A solid square man with the swept back gray hair and a lined, wind burnished face, he looked at the three with flinty eyes. Bullseye felt the man's power even when he didn't want to. Here was a soldier who became a three-star general by doing incredibly brave acts that verged on insanity. Insanity that could just as easily be focused on his subordinates. I know what you're thinking, he told him in his gravelly voice. Is this wise, general? Should we be seen together? Brooks hefted his Remington 1100 and rested it on his shoulder, as if on a parade ground. Well, R-H-I-P, they all know what that meant. Rank has its privileges. How do you keep people from noticing a group of West Point graduates? You put them in a place where people are accustomed to seeing them. Bullseye felt even more anxious now. There was no one around. You ordered us here, General Morton said. We're here. What's this about? What is this about, Brooks said softly, ominously. Firebird is fine, if that's what concerns you. That was both good news and bad news. At once, the other three men knew what this was about. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, Brooks quoted as if Morton hadn't spoken. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. Who said that, asked the general. He looked into the face of each man. Reynolds seemed to look back at him, but in fact, his gaze wavered between the general's eyebrows and eyelashes. Bullseye looked around like a soldier on point. 
Only Morton stared back defiantly, his lips tight. The Quran, sir, Morton replied sharply. Verse 812, just one of the more than 100 verses that call Muslims to war with what they call non-believers. And who do they call non-believers, General Brooks asked. Anyone who isn't Muslim, Reynolds interrupted. Quran 551 states that Muslims are not to take Jews and the Christians for friends. Allah describes them as unjust people. The Quran invokes kill the infidel 120 times, General Brooks said quietly, almost to himself. He gazed at the empty sky. What kind of sane nation permits these people to practice such open hatred? Sir, Morton said, I thought we were here to discuss Firebird. <clears throat> General Thomas Brooks, U.S. Strategic Command, lowered his Remington shotgun and fired a warning blast of scatter shot at Reynolds' foot. Reynolds' shins caught a few ricocheting pellets. Morton and Bullseye stiffened. Reynolds fell to one knee, but by sheer force of will, he did not scream. After a moment, as the shock fled and pain struck, he hissed, then grit his teeth, then slammed both fists into the ground. Brooks didn't even look at him. Instead, he locked eyes with Morton. We are planning to detonate a super weapon in Mecca, and you spend weeks, weeks screwing around with whores? Thoughts shot through Morton's head like spears. That was my fault, not, how do you know I'm finished, Brooks seethed. Morton's lips clapped shut. It had been on the news, the pursuit, the shootout, but the incident had been scrubbed. There was nothing to tie it to them. The assassins had gone to ground. I'll stop right there uh, on page 38 of my new, newly released novel, Countdown to Mecca. When I return, we'll go to the news, views, and reviews, and two more pages from one more chapter of this sterling novel, Countdown to Mecca. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. We'll go from fiction to nonfiction. Man attacked by 50 black teens when he tried to break up fight in Baltimore. I'm sure it's not covered by the uh, news outlets. It's a heartbreaking story. A white man, 61 years old, tried to break up a fight between two girls. And the gang of animals attacked him. They almost killed him. And the picture of the man's face after he was beaten was published in the Daily Mail. And I, I linked it on michaelsavage.com. And they, they uh, charged a 17-year-old boy for his role in the beating and they're looking for the other teens in Baltimore who beat him up see he went outside to ask two girls who were fighting on top of his truck to move along and continue to dispute elsewhere the mob of black teens began to hit and beat Fletcher until he fell to the ground but the attack of the thugs didn't end right there no after the beating he was left on the ground with broken eye sockets a broken nose, broken ribs, and a brain bleed. He also needed a blood transfusion. Antoine Lawson has been charged with attempted murder. And a 15-year-old girl was charged with assault. We haven't heard from the usual posse of supporters of the normal victims with regard to this brutal racial beating of this good Samaritan. Joe Lamb, who owns a business in Baltimore in the nearby neighborhood, saw the attack and said he wasn't at all that surprised with what happened based on what's happened to the neighborhood. He said it's gotten out of hand now, gone too far. The kids walk on top of cars, kick dogs, let dogs out, throw trash, steal milk from school and throw it at houses, threaten neighbors with bodily harm. That's your America under Barack Hussein Obama, Eric Holder, and of course, the good reverend Al Sharpton. Now on to the callers. A previous topic was, a poll says, people are leaving churches in a large number, mainly millennials, and we don't mean leaving them after uh, sermons, we mean just leaving the church. And Will on WABC, are you on, the, on the, here are you gone? Will is gone. All right, Will is gone. It happens in radio. Uh, WBAP in Dallas, Texas. Cliff, welcome. You're on the Savage Nation. What's your comment? I just wanted to say I'm not personally religious because I don't have any faith in it. I don't believe the Bible. Well, I'm not here. To, I'm not here to convince you, but I'm asking you: uh, Were you born into a Christian family? 
my grandma is a Christian, but my and she goes to church every Sunday. But my mother does not, and I was raised primarily by my mother. Do you feel anything missing in your life? No. <laughs> okay, I'm just asking. Uh, again, I'm not here to proselytize and tell you to go to church and your teeth will grow again, the ones that have fallen out, that you'll get a second set of baby teeth. Uh, but the thing is, you're how old? What age group? I'm 30. I just turned 30 May 4th. Well, it's interesting. so you've never felt the need for religion. I've gone, I've tried, but I just never got into it. I never felt... Right, in other words, you go there, and to you it's mumbo-jumbo, and ritual means nothing, right? Pretty much. So, um, let's say a tragedy strikes in your family. What would you say, oh my God, or oh my fate? What would you say? I've caught myself saying, oh my God, just because of repetition in our... You know, for me hearing it so often, I think it's ingrained in my head. Well, since we have an atheist president, if he's not Muslim, you could say, oh, oh, my bomber. Oh, so, oh, oh, my bomber. You could pray. You could pray to uh, Obama and maybe someone will help you. I'm a libertarian. I, I don't know who atheists pray to in times of need. I don't understand that. Who do they turn to in a hospital? I, I don't quite understand who they turn to in a moment of need. Let's say, God forbid, them or a mother. Do they turn and ask for God's help? Or do they, who do they turn to? Karl Marx? They get out Das Kapital and put their hand on, on, on Das Kapital and pray to Karl Marx. Who do they pray to? No one, I guess. They just leave it to fate or the doctors, I suppose. I'm agnostic, so I'm not how do you def How do you define yourself as agnostic? You believe in nothing? It means that there's a possibility that there is something, but I'm not 100% saying. I on the, so in other words, you're hedging your bet. <laughs> I like that. You're hedging your bet that if there is a God, you'll tell him you always loved him. <laughs> and if there is no God, well, what'd you lose? You didn't pray to somebody who didn't exist. I don't think you're alone, and I'm not here to mock your agnosticism, nor to sell you on, on religion. I'm just interested, just asking, because it's a growing trend, no question about it. Free copy of Countdown to Mecca to That Young Agnostic. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. So we're talking about religion, and they say that the number of Christians is diminishing in America. The number of uh, Muslims are increasing. Of course, and Obama is bringing them in by the by the plane load. Um, so I ask myself, okay, younger whites are not going to church. That's a given, the millennials, so, so, to, so to speak. I don't know what the age bracket is for millennial. Robert, are you still a millennial? Yeah. No, you're not. You're older? You're older than a millennial? What, when does a millennial end? 27? 27. So millennials don't believe in God. I wonder if young Muslim millennials in America are eschewing their faith. I really wonder. I don't know. I don't know if polls can find out those things, nor if these youngsters in the Muslim faith would, would cop to it. I just don't know. I use the phrase that's kind of antiquated. <laughs> cop to it's very interesting in this age of anti-police rhetoric. Dem senator accuses Obama of sexism toward Elizabeth Warren. You talk about the insanity of the left. Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown, I don't know what Sherrod Brown is. What is a Sherrod Brown? Is that a flavor of ice cream? Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown accuses President Obama of sexism in his attacks on Senator Elizabeth Warren, also a Dem. He said in a tweet, I know reporters, I think the president was disrespectful to her by the way he did that, made this more personal. I think referring to her as her first name when he might have not have done that for a male senator. Perhaps I've said enough. What in the world is a Sherrod Brown? Some kind of ice cream cone, or what is this? See, the president said, we have the soundbite, don't we, the president said, that she's a politician like all others, Robert? I know we have it. Uh, I want to ask you, I mean, don't call me on it. It's not sexist. It's that she's against his trade bill. And, you know, play it. Just play it. Let's listen and see what it's like. The truth of the matter is, is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Elizabeth is, uh, you know, a politician like everybody else, and you know she's got a voice that she wants to get out there, and 
Uh, I understand that. Uh, and on most issues, she and I uh, deeply agree. Um, on this one, though, her arguments don't stand the test of, uh, of uh, fact and scrutiny. What's wrong with that? He didn't say anything sexist. Elizabeth he called her Elizabeth because she's a friend of his. So this Sherrod Brown ice cream flavor, also a senator, I don't know the difference. They both melt in the face of any heat. Uh, Sherrod Brown accused Obama of sexism toward Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, my God. So we're talking about that, my new novel, Countdown to Mecca. Let me read you the last two pages for today. Remember what I'm going to do for you, because many of you, most of you won't buy the book, and my job is to uh, entertain you on radio. Remember, that's not to sell you a book. The book is ancillary. I, I got my set and frame correct. So in the last iteration, chapter five, Jack, you read from Jack, right? Now we're going to go to six. Oh, no, I don't want to go to six. How about the cops in the squad room? No, don't want to read that one. How about life in the safe house with the hookers? No, that's too risque for radio. No. How about we'll jump chapters now and count down to Mecca. 30,000 feet over America heading west. It's not badly written. No, I don't want to read that one on the radio. I have to pick the right one for you. Maybe back in San Francisco. I want to go to a restaurant with them. I, I, I have a lot of scenes set in North Beach and restaurants. I don't know where I put them in this book. In the other books, they were more prominent. How about Livermore, California? The Lawrence Livermore National Lab is in my novel. How do I know all these things? How do I have the ability to describe advanced aircraft, advanced weapons, generals, what West Point looks like, uh, Mossad? How do I have the ability to create Mossad agents and talk about uh, stations in Israel? How do I know all of these things? How did I figure it out? How do I create a Jewish gangster who doesn't exist? How do I create a Jack Hatfield? Where do these things come from? My imagination, that's where. And uh, that's what a novel is supposed to be. It's supposed to be novel, n new. What does novel mean? Interesting, new, that's all it means. Say, oh, that's a novel idea, right? That's what it means. So it's a story. And so I don't know these people. I don't know any Jewish gangsters. And I could make a joke, but no, I don't know any Jewish gangsters. I don't know any generals. I don't know any hookers. I don't know any disgraced uh, journalists. I don't know any clowns who had been in motorcycle accidents. But I, I invent them. I remember when I was younger, I used to think about Shakespeare's many characters. Like in one play, he'd have the fool, he'd have the king, he'd have the daughter, he'd have the this, the, 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 the. I said, how could he come up with all these characters? How do they exist in his mind? Without him getting lost and knowing, not knowing who he is. I know it was a problem for me when I was young, when I didn't have presence of mind. It's very hard when you're forming your personality and you're growing up to understand that you can have all of these characters visualized in your own head without losing yourself. Do you understand that? Now, this is, you know, I've never had this discussion ever in the world with anyone or on radio. And I've thought about actors, why they're so, I'm going to use, I want to use the exact word I'm looking for, why actors are so shallow. You take a guy like Sean Penn, you know he's a shallow, empty soul. You can look at him and know he's a fraud. You know he doesn't know himself from his characters. You know he can't differentiate the real Sean Penn from uh, the phonies he plays, the fake tough guys. And it's the same with many of the people in the media. They get lost in their characterizations on screen with who they are, which is why so many of them are on drugs and alcohol. Why they go into rehab, they don't know who they are. They're very good at what they do. I love acting. I love movies, as you know. I watch movies very frequently. I admire it enormously. But I don't look to them for political ideas or any leadership. Most of them are empty heads who couldn't go to a regular college, so they went into acting. Not all of them, but most of them in America are not well-educated. They don't even know the world around them, which is not true, by the way, in all countries. But nevertheless, in our country, most of them are empty, head, em empty and shallow, just as you would expect. But the point I'm making is that most actors lose themselves in their role in real life, and they start acting out one of the roles they played or they portray in movies in real life, and they don't know who they are. And they get frightened when confronted with the question of who they are. I don't suffer from that. I did when I was young. I don't, don't get me wrong. There was a time in my life when I was younger when it was very hard to know who I am. That's a great question. Who am I? Do you ever ask yourself that question? That's a nice question for a rainy afternoon. 
But as a great philosopher wrote, I think, therefore, I am. <clears throat> I've changed that slightly to I speak, therefore, I am. <laughs> And so let's turn back to the talk show called The Savage Nation. We're talking about why people are leaving uh, religion. Lisa on KBOI Radio. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind? Hey, Dr. Savage. I am 22, and I went to a high school in Mankato, Minnesota, which is heavily Islamic. I think about a third to half the students there were Islamic. And I wanted to say that a lot of them were not fans of Islam. They loved their parents but they weren't a fan of Islam. The girls would come in, and at the beginning of the school year, they'd be from head to toe in a black tent, Then the school year would go on, and uh, they'd get out of their parents' car, come in, take off their hijab, put it back on before they went. So Really? Oh, so there's hope for America. Absolutely. I don't think Islam will survive Westernization <laughs> at all. Well, I have, you know, jokingly said, or not so jokingly, that... There's a much less violent way to uh, diminish the war on terrorists, which is instead of launching drone strikes and injuring whole families or villages by accident, is that we should drop millions of bottles of airplane uh, booze in plastic bottles over the terror zones, along with uh, copies of Playboy or Penthouse. Uh, and I think the terrorists would be other directed and put down their guns, perhaps. Absolutely. That's actually a joke. I, I don't know if it translated on radio. But uh, uh, thank you for calling. I'm sending you a free copy of my novel, Countdown to Mecca. I hope that you share it with, a, with someone you love. WVNN Radio, Trey. Trey, Trey, Trey. What do you say, Trey? Dr. Savage, I, uh, pleasure to speak with you, sir. I just want to say there's three things that I, I believe. Um, I, I grew up in a private school, whatever, and uh, you know we're kind of inundated with chapel and stuff every day, so it gets old. Um, but I just want to, I think... From my friends and perspectives of what I've seen, even though I am here in the Bible Belt, um, religion is now irrelevant. Um, it kind of, you know, it's, it's old, it's ancient, archaic, whatever, whatever you want to put with it. Um, it kind of, it holds us to some kind of self responsibility. Um, I don't think people like that. Um, kind of in the yeah, interesting. Where, religion makes you responsible for your behavior. Interesting. It's kind of, and a conviction as well, you know, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not trying to, I'm not preaching here. I mean, I send just like everybody else, but I hear you talk about, you know, the three V's yesterday that you mentioned. Those are, those are awesome, you know, like. Well, what, what was that? What did I say? I remember, I don't remember that. What, what, what were the three V's? Vodka, vitamin, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> the, it wasn't vociferous, uh, but it was an attitude. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, sometimes, sometimes I create stuff on this show I don't even remember. I said, right, I, I, I believe in the three Vs. Vodka, vitamins, and vitriol keeps me going. Yeah. God, that's horrible. I didn't say that, did I? No, you did, but it was phenomenal. Oh, man, that's funny. I bet you I can make a lot of money if I put out a, a single tablet that contained vodka, vitamins, and vitriol in one. Well, people are buying everything. It'd be like Carter's Little Liver Pills was in the, in its uh, day, you know. How, how can I combine vodka, uh, vitamins, and vitriol, I'd like to know, other than on the Savage Nation? <laughs> so, hey, man, have you ever had a situation in life where you got injured or someone in your family got really sick and you had to pray? Did you ever do that? Absolutely, yes, sir. But, Bob, well, hold on now. So when you do, though, you do pray to God, correct? I do. Well, what you're saying is church is irrelevant, not God. Well, right. I think I think one thing by people pushing, people see people pushing religion, um, and they and they they judge the other person's acts. So they go, okay, well, this guy's telling me this is what I should do, but they they retake, recount something that that they know that person did maybe two or three years ago. And they go, you've got no right, man, to tell me what I what you know what what I can do, what I shouldn't. Look, do. I wound up in the hospital last year with something I've never talked about on the radio. And I'm not going to talk about it now. I don't want to scare people. It's over with. It happened, but I was very close to something really bad. I spent one night and I faced my maker, and I got shaken to my core. And I'll tell you something. It made me analyze everything I had done recently and throughout my whole life, and I was asking God what I did to deserve this and what I could do to uh, recover from it, and I made commitments to him. So I think that we're all able to be independent and wise guys when we're in good shape, but when something really heavy happens to us or our family, believe me, that's when God comes into play. That's, that's what I've discovered, Trey. I can't speak for the next man. And, and, it's, and it's interesting that millennials are moving away from religion in general, but the thing is once they have children, You'll find that in your you don't have any kids, right? You're not married. No, sir, I don't. Well, if the day comes that you do get married and have kids, 
I can almost guarantee you 100% and these words will come back to you. I won't be on the radio at that point. I can almost guarantee you you'll find yourself in church with those kids because you'll look at those children's eyes and you'll realize that they're clay that's unformed and undirected and they need guidance. And whether or not you think it's phony or relevant or this or out of date, where are they going to get their guidance from? The television? Uh, movies? Where, the teachers now in the, in the, in the uh, state schools don't give them much moral guidance or, or ethical guidance? The church is the last refuge of moral and ethical guidance. We understand how flawed many in the church world are or in synagogues. It doesn't matter what the religion is. We're not talking about Christians in particular. We're all flawed. We all have clay feet. None of us are God. So you say, well, then why should I listen to a man tell me about God when I know he's a phony, meaning he did this, he did that? You know, that's not the point. That is not the point. That's a cynical view that leads you to further cynicism and leaves you without any hope. The true view, the correct view, the right view, and the view that will save anybody is that although the teachers of religion are themselves flawed because they are men, they at least lead you to right from wrong, to green light, to red light, to yellow light. And without them, what we have is Baltimore. We have animals in the street doing anything they want without consequences. Let me send you a copy of Countdown to Mecca. I'll be right back on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It is the Savage Nation. I refuse to talk about 2016. I mean, give me a break already about Jeb Mush and uh, Ruby Tuesday and Rubio Tuesday because I don't know what it'll be on Wednesday and Celia Cruz's son, Ted. I am so not interested. You know, give me a nationalist candidate. I'd be talking about him every day. Give me one candidate who says borders, language, and culture. I'd have him on the show every second. I don't need a Jeb Mush whose ratings are about as low as that of Congress in general. We know what he is. Okay, some callers. Scott W. I'm sorry, KKOB Radio. Scott, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Uh, I have some good news for you. Uh, Barnes and Noble here in Albuquerque is just about sold out of down to Mecca, their initial order. And I was told by the clerk there that you're very popular. I'm popular in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's just that's a shock to me. I was a little shocked myself. I'm sh there are people who read books in Albuquerque, and number two, they read conservative novels by Michael Savage? I know. I was shocked. I book. don't know. How does that happen? I thought Albuquerque was a diehard left-wing uh, denizen. I thought it was just di dominated by le the left. No, I think that from what I've seen, I've only been here five years, but from what I've seen, it, it looks like a pretty good split. between. It must uh, be all the people from New York uh, in witness protection. <laughs> that could be I'm, I'm, joking. I'm, I'm joking. I don't know where they send them. They send them to Congress and witness. I think if you took people in witness protection and made them congressmen, they could get away with it today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Scott, thanks for the report from the field. A uh, free copy of Countdown to Mecca goes out to you today is the launch day. We have time for one more call. I don't know which caller it was I wanted. Is it gone? The guy with the, the church thing? Six, line number, oh, I love this one, line six. Please, fire away, Mike, go ahead. Hi, Mike, yeah, my name is Mike, and I just want to talk to you about a little bit uh, about religion. You know, I grew up in Modesto, California, and I'll tell you what. You know, I grew growing up in a little white Protestant town. You know, the kids around me, we never preached religion. When I went to Taji, Iraq, I had 52 mortars drop on my head, May 11, 2000, uh, 2011. I'm sorry, May 4, 2011, 52, 52 mortars landed on my head. I'll tell you what, when I was sitting in that bunker, I never thought about religion. You know what? what wait, hold it. What got you through that? That What got you through the mortar, mortar barrage? You know, when you're sitting in that bunker, you're looking around, and you hear all those booms and the concussions and the, you know, the blimp going off saying, incoming, incoming, incoming. The only thing that got me through that was sitting there thinking about my family. God bless you. Countdown to Mecca goes out to you. There it was. He didn't need God. He only needed his family.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Nation. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. The uh, left-wing communist mayor of New York, de Blasio, is so uh, inflated with himself that he's traveling uh, the country to see if he can run for the presidency as a far leftist. He has no idea that west of the Hudson River he's a buffoon. Meanwhile, his left-wing anti-police policies are paying off for him and his left-wing goon squad. Uh, muggings hit New York City Central Park. I'm reading for the Drudge Report. He doesn't write them. He just records them. Shots fired and smash and grab on Madison Avenue. Hammer-wielding man attacks women in Union Square. A group of subway thugs are uh, surfing subway cars, stealing equipment out of subways, changing destination signs to confuse passengers. of Elizabeth Warren, if you can believe it. Anyway, back to business on the Savage Nation, still trying to uphold America one show at a time. We were talking about my just-released novel, Countdown to Mecca, in bookstores today, reading from it, getting reports from the field as to whether the books are there or not, and I was pleased to hear that in Albuquerque they're sold out. That's a good thing. And then we talked about religion, uh, and the millennials are leaving the church, that kind of thing. And I was asking people, why they left religion. And we had a caller in the last hour named Mike who said that religion was, well, let him tell it again because we got him back. It was an amazing call. And I wanted to hear what he had to say about what, what he leaned upon or what he looked, what kept him going while the, the mortars were falling on him in Iraq. You know, there's an old joke that there's no, no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. Well, I think Mike will tell you that's not true. Mike on KBOI, welcome to the Savage Nation. So are you an atheist, Mike? You know, Mike, I gotta be honest with you. I never knew what an atheist was. And, uh, I just kind of grew up as one of those kids. My parents were Christian. They went to church. They said, Hey, come on, Mike, if you're going to come with me. And I said, Uh, you know, I'm too busy chasing girls and having fun. <laughs> you know, so, so to me, religion was never, never anything I was ever interested in. And so when someone came up to me and said, Well, what if you're atheist? You have to be atheist. Well, what's, what's that? I had no idea. And I gotta be honest, my, it's one of those things that religion is what you make it. If you believe in shooting kids at churches and, and schools, hey, that's absolutely wrong. Right's right and wrong's wrong. And I, well, how, how could so many Muslims believe that shooting kids in a church or burning a church to the ground or setting Christians on fire while they're alive is, is religious? How can they believe that? How is it that they're allowed to preach that in America? Yes. In some in some of these inflammatory mosque speeches, why are they allowed to do that? Oh hell, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. They should not at all. In that fact, I say you get them all on C seventeen, and you do a flyby over Iraq, and you do just a little drop below. I'll tell you what, and you get them out of this country. This is America. We all fought for it. If you don't, believe but you're, you're talking about preachers who preach. You're saying all Muslims should be deported from America, Mike. What leads you to that conclusion? Well, the way I feel about it, to be honest, is you don't, we don't want them in our country, and I don't want them, and we don't want to be in their country. And the reason why I really feel like that is because you're going to bring that negative energy into our country and preach bad behavior. We'll take, you know, you guys could all leave. What, what is do you do you really believe that all Muslims want to kill all Christians? You really believe that, Mike? No, no, I do not believe that at all. I do not believe that at all. But what you were you served in Iraq, and you were saying that you were in a in a mortar shower. Fifty mortars came at your bunker, and you didn't believe in God at that point. That was really what you were coming back to talk about. 
But didn't you meet, what are you saying, because of the Muslims that you were fighting, you became to hate all Muslims? No, I, I wouldn't say that. It's just, when we turned around, we gave the Iraqi army, we gave them 47 mortars. Two weeks later, we got hit at Camp Taj, Iraq, with 52 mortars that hit our base. And a few rockets here and there. This all happened at 4.40 in the morning. It lasted about four and a half minutes. And you can find the videos on YouTube. You can find the videos on LiveReach. It happened. Well, when we turned around and we saw those mortar caps on the, on the soil, you can walk to them. They say property of U.S. government on the end cap. So that's your first sign right there that something's corrupt. Even Are you saying that the mortars you gave the Iraq military were being fired at you as a U.S. troop? That's absolutely correct. So our own mm. artillery was hitting us. You never heard or saw about this in the paper, did you? Nope. No, nobody ever has. It's just no, but fire. Mike, I want to go back to you in the bunker when you were under that fire. You said you didn't believe in God. You you thought about your family. Is that what you said in the last hour? Yes, sir. That's all I thought about. I was, you know, so, I, you, so you're hunkering down in the bunker. The mortars are falling. And what, you're thinking of your mother, your father, and your siblings? Is that it? That's all. That's the only thing that got me through there. And you're sitting there and you hear boom. You say, damn, which, which one of my buddies just took a, a piece of shrapnel right now? And I got to be honest, you don't have to have religion. You know, religion, everybody in life wants to feel a positive energy, in my opinion. So this is how I feel. So it, this might be my own religion. I'm not sure. But everybody. But, you know, well, it's interesting you should say that because at the end of the day, I told my audience several times when I was in my more atheistic phases, which are seldom but increasingly seldom, uh, or not so seldom anymore, that to me survival is a religion unto itself. In other words, when you're really in doubt and you're really under a lot of pressure, all you can think about is living, right? Yes, sir. And that's all you want to do. I mean, that's, that's a natural mental mindset of human. I, don't I mean, you could pray all you want when things go bad, but at the end of the day, you got to pick yourself up and crawl out of that hole you're in and save yourself. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. And then you get to do it again for another nine months. Yeah, but I mean, even in day-to-day -day life, not under a mortar barrage. Let's say you lose a job or you lose a family member or you lose a girlfriend or you lose an arm. At the end of the day, don't you have to crawl out from under that pain and that suffering and that humiliation and that depression and somehow crawl on your own and survive? I couldn't agree more with you on that. And that's why I can't understand why somebody wants to blow themselves up or do harm onto somebody else for a religious belief. That's right, because it's, it's, it's antithetical, believe it or not, to your Western religious beliefs. You see, you may think you're not religious, Mike, but our entire thinking in this nation, the good stuff, is based upon our religious upbringing. Uh, it's very important to understand that is that you were taught right from wrong in your church, whether you stayed in the church or not, did not matter. You knew not to kill children. You would not throw a bomb into a school. The opposite is true for those subhumans who do such things. They're not the same as you and I. They're not in the human family. They're below the human family. They're not even in the human species. Yeah, Mike, I think, I think that... You prove a new adage, which is that there is such a thing as an atheist in a foxhole, which is something new. And I, would you like a copy of Countdown to Mecca? Because it's just out today. You know what? That sounds great. I hear they're hard to get. My dad radio station. And I sit next to him in the truck hearing it, and he had all your books. I'd be pleased to read your book, Mike. Mike, where is your dad? Uh, he's out in Newport Ritchie, Florida. We'll tell you what, we're going to send two copies to you, one for you and one for your dad for <laughs> having the good sense of raising you listening to a preacher savage on the Savage Nation. This is sort of like a preacher show, isn't it? Sort of like in its own way, uh, somewhat of a religious experience listening to me every day for your whole life. I try my best, Mike. Thanks. I'm glad you have a good sense of humor. I'll be right. Oh, no, it's no, no. We don't take a break right now. We have a for you, right, uh, Robert, or you want to do in the next segment? Now? We're going to start something for you very special right now. This morning, I had to get up very early, which I really don't like doing. I mean, very, very early. And appear on a radio show to promote the book. So I went to my... She's the only one in the media, by the way, who I call the queen of radio, because she is. 
She's not like the, uh, the poseurs on certain channels who are all, let us say, legs and lipstick. Laura Ingram, Michael Savage, right now on the Savage Nation. Joining us now, a man who's spoken out on all these issues from trade to immigration, as well as a, uh, a PhD, a, a novelist, best-selling, his trilogy, uh, a massive New York Times bestseller, the latest installment, the last installment, uh, is just out. My friend, Michael Savage, his new book, Countdown to Mecca, uh, After Abuse of Power and Time for War. We had him on for both of those previous books. Uh, and this is a novel, yet there's a lot of elements in this today that really, um, I think, jump out uh, at us because of what's happening in our country and beyond. And his book is also on our web webpage, lauraingram.com, on Facebook. And I highly recommend it. It's a great read, also terrifying. Uh, and he joins us now, Dr. Savage. It has been far too long. How are you, my friend? Well, Laura, thank you for having me on your show. And that has double meaning because you're the only national host that's having me on your show with Countdown to Mecca because it's too controversial. Oh, it may provoke the ire of people who think <laughs> and read. We can't uh, have that. No, no, we can't. We can't. Uh, we can't actually have a conversation about something as important as this. Uh, what, what Jay Johnson said a couple of days ago when he testified on Capitol Hill that we we we, we can explain. By the way, Laura, who is he? Where did he come from? Mm, I don't. I don't know guy, much about him. I, I, I hear he's a very nice person. He likes kittens and, and barefoot walks on the beach. So that's just what we need for the Department of Homeland Security. Not a returning military veteran who's seen the face of evil. No, we need someone who's who's friendly and understands the enemy. That's what we need. That's just perfect. Now, you, you wrote your novel um, with all of these you know, huge challenges facing this country in mind. Obviously, you go to sleep at night thinking about these uh, the changes that are happening in this country. Nothing that we agreed to as voters or citizens, but that's happening right under our noses. And, and on this issue of ISIS and radicalism and uh, what we've seen happening in our own country with radicaliz- radicalization, um, that inspired this book, I believe. Am I right? Absolutely. We see the penetration, the infiltration. We hear it from the top down. We don't understand it, but many of us do. Many of us don't want to accept what's So I figured, look, Laura, you know I do a daily show, and I figured the way to get the real message across is to fictionalize what's going on, because what is going on is stranger than fiction. Jack Hatfield, can you tell us about um, your protagonist, who's a freelance reporter, who uncovers something um, uh, frightening for some, uh, and, and he wants to get to the bottom of it. It involves the, the holy site of Mecca. Right, 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 right. Through a roundabout way, and it, okay, it's through a prostitute named Anna, Anastasia. So I have a, a prostitute, and she has a clientele which includes top U.S. generals. And she's plying her trade in a hotel in San Francisco when she overhears one word whispered by one of the generals to the other who is she, she is working. And that one word, Firebird, is the plot to blow up Mecca that they're planning. She doesn't know that. But just hearing the word Firebird when it leaves, uh, they're out to kill her. They don't even want that to leak. Well, her neighbor is... Jack Hatfield's brother, a new character I created called Sammy the Clown. He's actually a clown, mm-hmm. former Marine, auto accident, motorcycle accident, living on the proceeds of the accident. She runs to Sammy's apartment, the clown, and then the rest is kind of them chasing them. And this is a page turner. I mean, this is an absolute page turner. This book. I mean, you, you're gonna you, it, people say beach reads, and but it's a beach read. It's a beach read that. Just kind of it jumps out of some of the headlines that we're reading today. Obviously, we don't read of a plot to blow up Mecca, but we read of the the United States, our allies around the world, Israel, what's happening with these ridiculous Iran negotiations. Um, but you're right. I think most people, their eyes glaze over. On- Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by... The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O. Why does the military want to blow up Mecca in this book? I don't want you to give it all away, though, but can you give us a hint? 
It's not the military. It's a group of renegade generals. Oh, they go, oh okay. So they want, they want to make money off of, off of military industrial complex? I mean, what, what's their... Oh, no, no, no. They These are high-end intellectual generals, third-generation military, uh-huh. VMI, West Point, etc. They're real patriots. Mm-hmm. They feel that this millennial war against the West being waged by Muslims has to come to an end. Ah, the pinprick strategy doesn't work. The drone strategy doesn't work. you gotta, you got to have a body blow. Is that what, that, that's what they're... <laughs> Thing, Laura, this is the most important part of the book. I have an entire, you know, whole thing about them arguing over it with, with members of the Mossad in a secret bunker in Israel. The Israelis are involved with it. Again, a, a faction of the Israelis. And it's all the pros and cons of doing such a horrible thing. So I actually run through it. And why did I write it? Laura, maybe there are people thinking about this in the military right now, although I kind of doubt it because... Obama's purged the military of anyone who could stand up to him. But nevertheless, even if they're thinking about it, I want them to think it through, which I do for them in Countdown to Mecca. Do you, is, is part of the thinking, again, this is fictional account before people start going crazy on social media listening to Savage and uh, yours truly speak about this. So the the argument or the strategy would be take out the holy site and that if they don't start behaving, the next holy site of Medina goes? No. No. The generals think that since you've got four million people at the Hajj, mm-hmm. these are the most fanatical of all oh. Muslims from around the world. Okay. That's their thought. Oh, I see. They so, don't realize, though, as, as one of those against it says, if you kill a member of someone's family, you make the family your enemy for the rest life. of your life. But isn't that the rub? I don't think people think this through. It's actually the argument against drone strikes. Mm -hmm. And Michael, yeah, that's that's the rub here, is it not? That the the way, I mean, the way we 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 fight this is not make sure the people that are coming into our country are the you know right you know right immigrants who assimilate into our society and have our general values and are are people with skills, real skills. But it's and then hope for the best. I don't understand how anyone can't see what this man's doing to the country. You want me to get started on, on immigration? Well, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't mind since we have uh, many Republican presidential candidates, including the, the most likely nominee of Jeb Bush, who basically yeah, agrees Jeb with Bush Obama on everything. Sorry, Jeb Bush is, is just what he sounds like. He's a complete... He's a McConnell. I call McConnell the gobbler. I mean, you, you get your favorite topic, trade. McConnell is now lobbying for Obama. So what does it mean, Laura? The one-party system, the Democrats, the Republicrats I've talked about since 1994. Join the Savage Nation. 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE. To my uh, brilliant novel, Countdown to Mecca. And so you would expect me to ask you, did you see Countdown to Mecca in the bookstore? Did you go look for it? Where was it? Was it under feminine hygiene? Did they place Countdown to Mecca under the feminine hygiene section, perhaps? Will you buy one and you get a get one free? Let's put it that way. Have you bought Countdown to Mecca in a bookstore? I think it's an important story because since I'm the most boycotted major media figure, if I'm not for myself, who will be? I have few friends in the media. One of them is Laura Ingram, the queen of talk radio. If she had me on today, I'd like you to hear some of that later on. I was also on a local show uh, with Brian Sussman, and that was uh, the local KSFO. Great, great interview on Countdown to Mecca. But listen what it's about. WND said, new Savage novel, plot to blow up Mecca, but it's not what some might think. What's this? They ask. Michael Savage's newly released novel is about blowing up Mecca. They say, yes, Countdown to Mecca, the final episode of a trilogy that began with abuse of power and a time for war is about a plot to destroy Islam's holy city. But it's not what many, particularly Savage's liberal critics, are inclined to think. You see, Savage's hero, Jack Hatfield, is the one man who might be able to stop the attack on Mecca. So I want to appeal to the Muslims in the audience who are not fanatical to understand what I'm trying to do here. In the novel, Hatfield is a freelance TV producer who lost his top-rated opinion show because of a liberal media smear campaign by a group that resembles Media Matters. Savage told WND in an interview, I don't call for blowing up Mecca. This is the thing. This is what the liberals are going to do. 
The same libs who got me banned from England are going to say my novel Count on the Mecca is too controversial and should be burned. Savage explained the book is about a renegade group of generals who plot to destroy Mecca, but it also deals in plain terms with the people responsible for the conflict in the first place. It shows what could happen given the militancy of radical Islam and the passivity of Barack Obama, he said. There could be a renegade group of generals who plan some catastrophic event to stop this madness that has been going on for millennia against the West. And we all know that would lead to Armageddon, which none of us would benefit from, he said. Anyway, you get the picture, right? Now, I want to backtrack for a minute. Democrats gave Barack Obama a black eye. It's the biggest black eye of his life. Now, I got to explain to you, this trade deal was shot down not by the Republicans, but by the liberal Democrat wing. What you should also know is that this was Obama's biggest priority since forcing socialized medicine down our throats, which they did through trickery, telling us we'll learn what's in the bill after we after they pass it. They did the same thing here. This was shown to congressmen and congresswomen only in secret, only in the basement. They were not allowed to take notes out. It's like something out of a bad novel what this character in the White House has done to this country. He has brought the worst elements of the Stasi to the intelligence community, the worst elements of gangsters in the ex-Soviet Union to the White House itself. But he's such a smooth con man that many of you still think he's a wonderful, kind, loving man. His own party said no to him today. And those trying to bail the president out from this great defeat are the Republican Party. The Republicans are trying to bail out President Obama. From a trade deal that would, let us say, gut American industry and American jobs to an extent that we'd never recover from. And what's interesting here is that Senate Democrats announced today that they're going to vote to block a debate on fast-track legislation. Now, much of this is gobbledygook to the average American. You don't know what's really going on. But Obama's trying to sell out the last remnants of American industry american workers it's so bad the guy is such a traitor that his own party turned on him every free trade deal that the u.s has signed has brought about an increased trade deficit and hundreds of thousands of lost american jobs every single free trade deal nafta gafta gat wto and now this one it's beyond belief that as a conservative american I want to thank all the Democrats, including the most liberal of them, who got together to block this dangerous bill. This TPP Asia trade bill is a nightmare. How many jobs would be gutted? Nobody really knows. But if Obama's for it, it must be bad for America. That's all I know. If Obama is for it and his own party's left wing is against it, you can just imagine how far he's gone uh, to the left. And what's funny about this is that as a nationalist, uh, I cannot believe that it took Democrats, liberal Democrats, to defeat even a debate on the bill. Now, what is the bill about? I'm only going to give it a, a short version. The bill would give President Obama the authority to bring forward a trade bill in the future upon which Congress could either vote yes or no, but they could not amend it. In other words, it would give him total power over uh, future trade and for whatever the reasons are it's the left wing in the democrat party that said no to even debating it senator ron wyden democrat no opposition uh maria cantwell as left as they come no diane feinstein no claire mccaskill left wing fanatic no patty murray never saw a communist manifesto she didn't want to frame in the white house no Bill Nelson, Democrat, fanatic leftist, no. Mark Warner, no. The Senate needs 60 votes to begin a debate on fast-track authority. They said no. Now, the spokesmouth for Obama, Josh Ernst, the mini Goebbels of our time, said that it was only a procedural snafu uh, that uh, blocked the vote. But the rest of it will be boring to you. I get it. I just wanted to give you the news, by the way. There is big news out there. The poll shows those in the U.S. drifting away from religion, which is an interesting story. The number of adults who self-identified as Christian fell from 78% to 70%. 
driven mainly by drops among Roman Catholics and some Protestants, according to the stinking Pew Research Center poll. Non-religious U.S. adults who identify as atheist, agnostic, or of no particular faith have seen their ranks swell over that same time period by 6 percent points to 22.8 or 56 million people. In other words, religion is dying in America somewhat. So I'm going to ask those of you under 30, because if I say, I, you know, have you left the church, most of my audience are older people. You'll say, no, I haven't. I go every Sunday. Please don't call if you're over 30. I want to know why the so-called millennials have given up on religion. That's an interesting question. And if you're under 30 and you're no longer religious, please tell. And I don't care what your religion is, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, because I can guarantee you as I speak to you on this show today that even young Muslims are not faithful anymore. So you don't understand what's going on. This may not be as bad as it seems. I want to I wanna move on if I can, but I know many of you are so agitated with the questions I raised. It's only the beginning of graduation season. I can't wait till that dingbat Nancy Pelosi speaks again. And after that, she almost burnt Oakland to the ground by telling them to be, what was the word again? I keep forgetting the word. Disruptors. Dummy. Dummy. Be a disruptor. Yeah, they, they almost burnt Oakland to the ground a, a week ago. The loser of bums on the bottom. The hordes, the mobs of nobodies. Wasn't bad enough what happened in Baltimore. She's going to get up now and want, wants more. Instead of bringing the people together, instead of saying what happened in Baltimore was terrible, let justice take its course. Instead of telling the kids at Tuskegee to go out there uh, because they've never had a greater opportunity in the history of Africans in America, there's never been a greater opportunity for Africans in America than today. Look at me. Look at my husband. Look how far we've come because this is not a racist nation. And you can go as far as your talents and your uh, wishes will take you. That's what she should have said. Instead, once again, she wraps herself in the victim. What if we had the first Jewish president? I don't know who. I'm going to make some, I, I don't know who. What if a day comes we have the first Jewish president, and the Jewish first lady gets up there, and she starts complaining again about being Jewish and being picked on, and that people don't like her because of her, her, her mother's accent or whatever. The, I mean, how would, how would the nation react to a Jewish first lady saying the same things? Like, I was subject to another set of questions. Or uh, am I too uh, loud or too angry or too emasculating? And what would America say to a thing like that? And what when we have our first Hispanic president, if there's an Hispanic first lady who's as low class as her, who gets up there and starts talking again about racism when she's first lady. Ipso facto, if there was such bad racism, she wouldn't be first lady, would she? Since whites make up 68 or more percent of the population, by definition, the nation has no racism left in it, except from her, maybe, and her cohorts, who are steaming up everybody in the country. Everywhere you turn, all they want to do is turn everyone against each other. Anyway, you get the picture. It's kind of repugnant. What I want to do now is talk about something positive. My new novel, Countdown to Mecca, because it's out. I worked very hard on it. It's the last in the series. Many of you bought uh, the previous editions of A Time for War and Abuse of Power. It's a thriller. It's a novel. It's power fiction tinged with terrorism and intrigue with an old-school rough-and-tumble journalist as its hero. A thriller sure to score a bullseye with its target audience, said Publishers Weekly, of the earlier one. A fast-paced international thriller whose story spans the globe. Dr. Savage is at a home run with abuse of power. The story grips the reader and delivers the goods. Free Republic. They love my first two. So I think this one is the best and the last. This is not a boring nonfiction book. This is meant for people to pick up and read and enjoy reading it. What a movie this would make. I mean, let's be clear. I'm boycotted in Hollywood, right? They, they should have made a movie a long time ago out of a time for war. It's dramatic. It's set in San Francisco. It's got every element. Sex, romance, excitement, terrorism. Uh, I guess Katzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg wouldn't touch it for obvious political reasons. So this book reads like a movie script. For those people who like action, Countdown to Mecca is it. I can't tell what anyone's legacy is going to be in our crazed, debased, degenerate society. Take a look at who's running the media. What does legacy mean when you have degenerates running the media? What does a legacy mean when you have anti-Americans running the media? What does it mean when you have a pope who says 
things that make Fidel Castro say he'll go back to church. The world has been turned upside down by the most demonic president imaginable. Be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I, Michael Savage, trust to buy my gold and silver from, SwissAmerica.com. The amazing shrinking president is not only physically disappearing, but he has politically disappeared as well. His left wing has basically defeated him on the trade bill. It actually wasn't the trade bill per se. It was a debate about whether to go to the trade bill on a vote. And the left wing said no to him on this secret, sneaky, anti-jobs bill. And the only people trying to save it are Mitch McConnell uh, and Orrin Hatch, the same people, by the way, who gave us the uh, likes of Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the United States Supreme Court. Same people who gave us Loretta Lynch are now trying to give us a trade bill with China that would kill jobs and industries. So there it is. Now the White House is putting the spin on it, saying that this defeat was only a procedural snafu, etc. But the fact is, this was the biggest loss in Obama's political career. My only wish would be that uh, the same coalition would get together to put a stop to the flood of illegal aliens coming into America and take a close look at the type of immigrants that Obama has prioritized into the United States of America to remake it in his own image. That is largely not white. You know, one of these days I'm going to do a show on the European-American contributions to civilization, particularly our society and our civilization. I am so sick of listening to this rubbish about the white male and the white race and white privilege that I'm going to do a whole show an entire show, I've done it before, by the way, on white male inventions, which was immediately ignored by the media. But the fact of the matter is, I'm sick of listening to this garbage. And if I'm going to hear shows about African American, Asian American, Indian American, this American, well, what's wrong with doing a show on European Americans and their contributions to civilization, especially ours? But I want to turn to this European American's contributions to civilization. Michael Savage, since I come from people who came from Europe, and I'm an American, I'm a European-American, and uh, I've contributed a number of books, broadcasts, I've rescued some rainforests, I've done some scientific research that will last for centuries, by the way. The collections are in museums around the world. I never talk about it, but you'll find that it's true. And today I want to talk about a novel called Countdown to Mecca, which is launched today in the bookstores after long last. I've been waiting for it to come out for months now with all the news about Islam and this and that. I thought it should have been out a month ago. So what I've done is something I've never done before. I have one, two more chapters to go. I said that I would read the first two pages of each of the first five chapters today. And then maybe the next time I'm on the radio, I'll read the next two pages of the first five chapters for a couple of days to see what you think of it. And then I'm asking you if you can find the book in the bookstores. We're getting one report after another of the bookstores not having the book. Once again, Michael Savage is banned uh, from bookstores. Once again, there's a blacklist. Once again, there's subterfuge. Once again, there's sabotage. And then we're talking about a political topic, which is a poll showing those in the United States drifting away from religion. Now, since this was done by the Pew group, I don't really trust it that much but it says the number of people identifying as christians went down from 78 percent to 70 percent from 07 to 014 okay uh those identified as jewish rose 0 0.2 percent how can you figure that out well those identifying as muslim more than doubled to 0 0.9 percent no kidding those identified as hindus rose slightly to 0 0.7 percent thank god for that i love indian food uh the more curry joints the better of course, that's not what the Indians are bringing anymore. They're, they're, they're tech workers, so guys like Zuckerberg can make more billions. And Microsoft, Mr. Nice Guy, can pocket even more money. And the number of Buddhists was unchanged at 0.7%. The poll surveyed roughly 35,000 adults across the U.S. between June and September by telephone. Tell, yeah, by telephone. Uh, excuse me, by telephone? Hello? 
Yeah, who is it? I'm with the pupil. Drop dead. And you hang up. What do you mean by telephone? They don't even use cell phones. They call landlines on a pole and they think this is an accurate survey. All right, hold it a minute. Beyond belief. Savage.